The wind of change is finally here. The church is no longer confined to a building. Step out with me as we embark on this new church normal together. Here at the coffee shop. fall of 1998 in South Sudan, in the middle of the bush, standing over a body of a small child that from the waist down was gone from a landmine. I knew I had to do something. I'm devastated inside. I knew I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I had to do something. Tell me about, briefly about your history before God got a hold of you. Right. Well, uh, uh, most people don't realize this unless they know my family. I was born into a Christian family. And I I always describe my mom. I I think she only sinned three times in her whole life when she gave birth to me and my two brothers. (laughs) Uh, My mom came out of the womb speaking in tongues. I I mean, she she was a Christian all her life. My dad was a pretty rough guy. Uh, he he was he was a marine, and he was he was a pretty tough guy, you know. Uh, but he was born again Christian, you know. I never seen him drink or anything, you know. And he brought us boys up that uh, uh, never to walk away from someone in need. He brought us up a bully in the school. You bully the bully, you know. So so. Uh, I was raised in a Christian family, but at 11 years old, I think my, my, my reason for getting into drugs and partying is probably what most people in the world today still does. They want to fit in. And at a young age, at 11, most people are in their teens when they feel like this. I thought in my mind, I just want to fit in. I just want people to recognize me, to accept me. So I started smoking cigarettes and marijuana at 11 years old. By the time I was 15 years old, uh, 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 I'm doing cocaine and heroin, you know, shooting up. But then I found myself at 15 years old with a drug addiction. And I didn't care if I fit in anymore. I didn't care if you liked me anymore, you know. I started selling drugs at a very young age. I started selling drugs at 15 years old. And... uh, Everything just just kind of went off the deep end then. I started running drugs from Minneapolis, Minnesota to Chicago, Chicago to Orlando, Florida. And uh, then I started getting in trouble. You know, I was arrested five times, but I was never convicted of a crime. And I thank God for that because most people don't realize I run and operate an armed security company in East Africa. That's what I do for a living. You know, so if I would have been convicted of any crime, I couldn't be doing that, you know. So what happened, I was living in Orlando, Florida, and I got into a really bad bar fight. I mean, it was really bad. I can think back of it, and I can remember the bodies were laying on the floor, bleeding, knife, people were stabbed, shot. I mean, it was really bad. And I said, if I make it to that door, I'm done living this life. Now, I didn't say, God, if I make it to that door, I'm going to serve you. I did not give my life to Christ that night. I knew he was real. I just didn't need him. But I said that night, God, if I make it to that door, I'm done living this life. And I did. That was the night that I started changing my life around. Two years later, when I walked into a church and said, God, here I am. And and Lynn found the Lord first. She yeah, lived with the Lord two years, right about the same time that we moved. We moved, uh, we moved from Orlando, Florida, back to my hometown in Pennsylvania. And she started going to church with my mom. Now she was raised in a Christian family as well. Mm. And you're so there's nothing like the power of a praying mother. I'm and there's you. nothing like the power of a praying wife. Yeah. So you had it on both sides. Yeah, yeah. But it was it was two years after that. I mean, 
I always knew I had a call in my life. I knew when I was a child that I was to be a preacher. Uh, oh. It was prophesied over me. It was prophesied over my mom when I was in the womb. Right. At what point did God, because we all enter that place where, where, where we've said yes, yeah. but God has to strip us and break us. You Give know, us a few. At the moment that I gave my life to Christ, I was in construction. I was running a successful construction company. I had, uh, I owned and stuff uh, homes, uh, okay, that I used used as like rentals. At, at the time that I gave my life to the Lord, I had everything in life that I would want, but I had everything in my life going on. I literally uh, uh, started putting money into the mission field, thinking that I could change God's mind. I started thinking, I know what I'll do. I'll put money into the mission field, uh, and God would rather have my money. The one year, the, the year before I went on a mission trip, I put almost $50,000 into the mission field. Uh, thinking that God's going to say, wow, I would rather have your money. You can stay in the U.S. So Boy, then, did he have a different plan. Right. So then I went on a mission trip. And in my mind, I was thinking, I know what I'll do. I'll go on a mission trip and that will stop God from wanting me in the mission field. And I knew it wouldn't. But in my mind, I was trying to fool myself, thinking I'll go on this mission trip. And God's going to let me off the hook. And I went on a mission trip, and that's when I got involved in the Coney War. And I believe that God will put opportunities in front of us. And I believe that the decisions that we make will determine our destination in life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes. I got in the middle of the Coney War, and I remember I went back home weeks later, and I couldn't function. I wasn't right. All I could think of was the fighting, the children that were killed and murdered. And three months later, I was back in Africa. And I knew that was going to be my home. I knew it then. Did you, <laughs> when you had the prophecy spoken over you by the missionary from Africa at church that night or, or that moment, did you really tell him all? Did you what'd you say yeah. to him? I was I was pretty upset. I was going to beat him up outside the church. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was pretty upset, you know. But I knew I was mainly upset because I knew it was true. You know, even even as a drug dealer, even as an addict, uh, even when I put a needle in my arm, I still remember I knew God had a calling in my life actually went to the, 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 the missionary from Africa. Uh, uh, I went to his project and put a roof on. And while I was at his project, uh, there, was, there was a war going on all around us. And I remember the one day I got away and I got one of the soldiers to take me into the war. And so we actually went into where they were fighting and everything. I mean, the, that, the dead bodies were laying. It, it was bad. Is, is that when you saw the child? Yeah. 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 And, and that was the moment when you said, God, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now, now that, that missionary, what they'd done was chaplain work. So he wanted nothing to do with children. I mean, his ministry was chaplains only. So I went back home after being in an ambush and everything on that trip. I mean, uh, I, I experienced everything on that trip. And I went back home and three months later is when I went back to Africa, uh, not in the same area. I went into northern Uganda uh, in, into the border area where the Kony War was at its it was at its strongest when I went in there. Wow. And I, I literally bought the land where the big orphanage is still there to this day, uh, still operated by us. I bought that land on my second trip in. 
Well, imagine being living in a country that is so much terror that you will send your children into the streets for safety. When it starts to, just starting to get dark in the evening, the children will come walking into town and then they will sleep on the streets. They'll uh, sleep under the porches. And then in the early morning, when it just starts to get daylight, they'll walk back to their village. And you knew that God was telling you, this is the place. And even yeah. though it was right in the middle of the thick of things, that's where the, God wanted it. The actual original orphanage that was built from the movie and everything, it was a battlefield. That ground where that orphanage was, was literally a battlefield. There was blood shed all over that land. But wow. that's what God said, this is where I want you to build the children's village. And I remember looking up in the air at the moment, because I, I had my AK on my shoulder, my sidearm. I remember looking up in the air and I said, God, do you know where I am? <laughs> because right. I, yeah, I mean, I was thinking, God must not know where I'm at right now, because <laughs> this is in the middle of a battlefield, you know. And uh, God yeah. said, that's where I want the children's village. Is one of the only orphanages in all of South Sudan that was never shut down one time due to war. Never shut down. It was from the day we opened the, the gates, it was always there up till now. Never was closed. You knew, you, you had to have known, because I know in the movie it was mentioned that this guy is, he has angels around him. He can't be shot. Well, here was the other thing that in the movie, it showed the rebels attack the orphanage and burn it down. The truth was the, the orphanage was packed three times and they never penetrated through a bamboo fence. The orphanage never was burnt to the ground. The, I mean, and we used to have a bamboo fence around. Uh, the, 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 the people that attacked us would come in with RPGs and shoot them at the bamboo. And before they would hit the fence, they would nosedive into the ground. So the, the orphanage <clears throat> was attacked three times by rebels, and they never got through a fence made of bamboo. That's God. Yeah, I'm telling you. That's and God. <clears throat> all the battles that we were in, <clears throat> there was never a soldier that was with me ever got killed. Yeah, wow. wounded, but never, not one person ever got killed. We had a truck one time that was ambushed, <clears throat> and one of the soldiers got killed, but we were giving him a ride. He wasn't even one of our soldiers. We were just giving him a ride. Okay, so I want to ask you, in the beginning of the movie, there's that moment where you're with your friend, you guys are, are partying in the car, and, and a hitchhiker gets in. Yeah. And Is that on, true? Yeah, that's based on the truth. Uh, <clears throat> it didn't quite happen the way that it showed in there, but that was all based on the truth. Uh, <clears throat> what they did in the they took my book that I wrote, Another Man's War, and they took stories from it, and then they combined the stories. But yeah, that was true about the hitchhiker. Yeah, uh, it's in my book. I left, I left that town the very next day or a day later on a Greyhound bus and went to Florida. I actually went to a couple different cities because I thought I killed the guy, so I thought the law would be looking for me. And back in them days, you remember, there was no cell phones. There wasn't even a fax machine, you know, no computers. So I made it down to Florida. And then it was, I didn't call back home for over a year. No one knew where I was. So I called back home and uh, I spoke to one of my friends and he said, Sam, aren't you coming back up? And I said, man, you know, I can't come home right now. I said, and he said, why? And I said, well, that Indian. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I killed that guy, didn't I? And uh, he said, no, you didn't kill him. He said somebody picked him up and took him to a hospital. The movie ended as if you had just gotten upset with God and, and God left you. But in the documentary, you said that that's really not the way it happened. 
I mean, no, you, you had your I, ups and downs, but I, I, I have never got angry at God. Uh, I got a little upset because things don't always happen the way I want them to. Yeah. And I still feel like that, but I have never got angry at God. I have never, I have never uh, 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 had any disbelief that he wasn't real. So yes. that's that part. I mean, even in the, in the lowest of my days, when I was a drug dealer, when I was a heroin addict, I mean, the worst of the worst, I, I always knew he was real. What has Sam Childers done since then? Like well, to start with, the movie is like 10 years old. Right. And it's still rated on HBO and uh, primetime and many of these places. It's still rated as number two most watched old movies. Wow. And so the, it's still popular. There is, a, there is a part two machine gun preacher that should be in the production because of COVID. It got shut down last year. So we feel that this year or next year, it'll start in the production again. So there is a part two getting ready to come out. Praise God. But That's since, awesome. since the movie, like about 10 years ago, now about 12 years ago, God spoke to me and told me if I was just going to build another orphanage, he said, why don't you just go home? And I couldn't quite understand what he was meaning. And what most people don't realize, if you have an orphanage in a third world country, now not our orphanage, but if there's an orphanage in a third world country, you have to leave at 15 years old. More than 70% of those children end up in prostitution because they don't have a skill in a trade. So about 12 or 13 years ago, God spoke to me that we needed to start teaching a skill and a trade. So we are very big into that now. We opened up a restaurant 12, 13 years ago, uh, teaching skills and trades out of that restaurant. And it went from one restaurant to a commercial farm. We have a farm in Northern Uganda uh, where, where it's, it's like a thousand acre farm. But it's amazing what's going on at that farm. We're teaching farming, ranching, irrigation. We're teaching auto mechanics. We're teaching people how to work on tractors. Uh, most of our tractor drivers are women. So, I mean, we're teaching people a skill and a trade. But it, it didn't stop there. I think as Christians, God will put us on the right track doing something. But we get satisfied with a little bit instead yes. of keep it expanding. So yes. over the years, I, I just kept wanting more and wanting more of God. So it yes. went from the commercial farm to we literally own and operate the largest uh, American style truck stop in northern Uganda. It, wow. we, we used to own the second largest. The first largest truck stop in Uganda was Shale. But our place is bigger than Shale. It's a one-stop shop, so we own hotels, we own restaurants, but uh, the big thing is teaching a skill and a trade. So on our payroll right now in East Africa, we work over 500 people a day. Wow. Those are people that had no education. Those are people that had no skill. Those are people that's been trained. So we call our new project Angels Truck Stop and Training Center. So yeah. and what, what we do is we train people with a, a skill and a trade. That's how you change a nation. You know, yes. missionaries think, well, I'm going to go to that country and preach the gospel and change a nation. Just teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ does not change a nation. Right. The gospel of Jesus Christ, then teaching a skill and a trade that creates structure. That's how you change a nation. And that's what we're doing now. I mean, we drill wells. Uh, we have drilled over five dozen wells over the years. We have repaired dozens upon dozens of wells. Last year, just during COVID, I mean, we, we, we're, we're always in need of money. But last year during COVID, when things were rough, we gave away over 90 ton of rice from our farm. So, so God has really been blessing us. And, and that's why he said, don't stop. You were asked, and in, in, I think it was one of the interviews, 
why not the U.S.? And you said, we've got problems here, but Africa, what, where you were at the time, this is a different kind of problem. Yeah, and, and people just don't get it. And that's why you were so shocked. We have a project right now going on. I don't know if you've seen it on Facebook. It's called the Bush Kid Project. You know, I've been in war for so long. I don't, I want to be in the bush, okay? Right. And some, some men that has been in war and even women, they know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when mm -hmm. you get used to something, you'll dwell to be there. So I spend, a, I, I, I wanted to be in the bush all the time. So I started searching God. I said, God, I got to do something. So we started this bush kid project where we will drive. We bring doctors, we bring medicine, we bring a blood lab with us. And we go, you can see this on Machine Gun Preacher Facebook. We drive two hours, three hours deep into the bush where children are literally dying. What people don't realize in East, in Africa alone, they say a child, a child dies every two minutes, malaria. So what we're doing, we're going deep into the bush with this Bush Kid Project. We are saving children. In four months time, we took care of almost 800 children, treated them for and stuff like malaria. These children came to us on match. They came to us uh, uh, yeah. from the parents carrying them. What, I had to get my mindset that all that matters to God in my life is what I do. Yes. So I can't focus on you. I can't focus on family. I can't focus on friends. I can only focus on, am I doing the best I can do? So now I'm getting older, you know, I'm becoming an old man now. I'm 58 years old. So now I focus on, am I doing the best I can do? Do you feel like, and I say this a lot, um, you know, they always start out of the gate great, but it's really not how you start, it's how you finish. Right, absolutely. Well, you know? as I said, you know, I live in Africa full time. You know, Africa is my home. I'm yeah. only here till April 20th, and then I'll fly back to Africa. And I'll be honest with you, I'm homesick. I, I, I really, I said the other day, I, I'm ready to go home now, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I'm very homesick, but because, because of the work, because of raising money, I'm just not able to go right now. You know, I got to stay and get every meeting I can get until, until it's time for me to leave. But I can tell you, I'm very homesick. You know, a lot of people, when they come to, I have a bike shop outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we build custom motorcycles, and that's also the office building for Angels of East Africa, <clears throat> and it's a beautiful office building, and people come there all the time, and the first thing out of their mouth is they'll say, why does he live in Africa? Because people look, and they see the motorcycles. They see a thriving business, and they see everything I could have and could enjoy and still go to Africa four or five times a year. But people, people just don't understand. I mean, I, I could live the life of a dream, of an American dream, but I feel I'm living the dream of being a servant in the work, doing the work in Africa. I, I, I wouldn't want any other life, you know. <laughs> Bats or spiders? Uh, I don't like either one, to tell you the truth. But Me either. I, I've learned how to deal with spiders. You know, you can, you can watch me on YouTube. I got a message that I've preached uh, around the world so many times about spiders, you know. I saw it. Uh, yeah. And so, but, but I can honestly say that God has delivered me of the spider thing, you know. Oh, I, I wish used, you would deliver me. The smallest spider, I would run. I mean, I, but now, you know, I have no problem taking my hand and giving them a needle tap, you know. But uh, uh, I know to be like that, I would run. Uh, so you, do you, like being in the bush, don't you come in contact with some like monstrous bugs and spiders? Yeah, I believe, you know, I read one time that the largest spider in the world was in South America, you know, the largest spiders in the world. 
But uh, I have to say that's a lie. It was in my tuku in South Sudan. Oh, no. I've seen spiders like uh, the size of paper plates was the biggest spider that I've seen, you know. And, and those I'm still a little afraid. But those are big enough you can shoot. You don't have, oh, to, you have to kill them with your hand, you know. <laughs> you can shoot a spider? Absolutely. Oh, when you're big, that's what you do. I've got to ask you, and I know you've said it a million times and probably a million more, but how did you get the name Machine Gun Preacher? You know, I don't really know because I normally, during the war, I carried a shotgun. Okay. But <laughs> I believe that the name was given to me from God. And wow. uh, I remember wow. I told my mom one day when, when, wow. when I felt God gave me this name. And I said, Mom, God just gave me a new name. And my mom was all excited and she was shouting to the Lord, you know, oh, that's wonderful. What, what is it? And I said, machine gun preacher. And she said, no, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, God told me that that name would be a marketing tool. Yes. And okay. it is a marketing tool for the loss, you know, because you could put Reverend Samuel Childers is speaking at the church. You could put that on your church sign. And you're not going to get too many people to really look at the sign. But when you put machine gun preacher will be here Sunday, that person driving by, you know, our whole ministry, when a church has us come in, is an outreach for that church because it will draw the non-saved, the non-church. So when, when somebody has the machine gun preacher come to their church, it's not about it's, it, it isn't so much about supporting our organization as much as it is a drawing card for the unsaved in your area. Yes. Oh, I totally get it. Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. You know, and it, My first two meetings in Naples, Florida were in bar rooms. Nice. And, and what's so crazy is people were drinking. But when, when it come time for me to speak, you could have heard a pin drop. But see, it don't matter if I'm speaking in a clubhouse, a bar room, a movie theater. I always share my testimony and I always give people the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ. So I, I literally challenge people to serve Christ. You would not believe what happened in the bar rooms. People gave their life to the Lord. Wow. And you would not believe the Christians that hacked on me and hacked on me. What kind of man of God would preach in a place like that? Six people gave their life to the Lord sitting at the bar over their drink and got saved. Tell the viewers how they can get on board financially, what it's they very, can do. It's very easy to remember our name, Machine Gun Preacher. <clears throat> So if you just Google machinegunpreacher.org, you'll come to our website and you can make your donation. I want to, I hope whoever hears this word that the people will act immediately. I preach in America. I go all over the place and I preach. And I see people crying in their seats, weeping in their seats. People promise you this, they promise you that. But what happens to American people is we go home, we turn our light on, we go and sit down, we turn the TV on, and we forget. I'm hoping that you won't forget after you see this. That's it. Are you happy? Okay, listen, we just want to say thank you to all of our supporters out there and God bless you. Everybody say God bless you. God bless you. Is it fair to say that
You're a missionary, or are you a mercenary? I will accept it either way.